Uh, how would you define the church? Somebody give me a definition. Somebody from over on this side. Anybody just stand up and say it loudly. What is a, what is a church? How do you define it? Anybody? It's the body of Christ. We just let it to death. They have a book. They have purpose on Very good. It's souls and they have a purpose on this earth. They are being transformed by the Holy Spirit. Being transformed. Amen. What if a group of, say, 10 or 12 of those are shopping and they bump into each other in the produce section of the supermarket and they are assembling, it's a body, does that constitute a church? Somebody said very clearly why it does not, because I thought Jesus said wherever two or three are gathered, there I am in their midst. <laughs> Why, why are the 10 or 12 people in the produce section of the supermarket who are assembling? The ch church means assembly. That's what the word means. Why is that not a church? Anyway. But let's say they are. They are. All of them are washed by the blood of Christ. A church, is, a church is a gathering of people who are cleansed with the blood of Jesus. A gathering of people what? Who are cleansed with the blood of Jesus. Cleansed by the blood of Jesus. But no, I'm, I'm saying these people are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. They're, they're 12 believers. They are not covenanted to each other. Okay. Uh, okay, let's say... Let's say that as they continue their shopping and their talking, they decide, hey, why don't we covenant together here in the supermarket? <laughs> <laughs> then do they become a church? No. Why not? They need to refurbish the supermarket. <laughs> Any one of you who confidently said no, <laughs> articulate why not. There is no pulpit in the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good answer. There is no pulpit. What else is missing that is a constituent unit of a church? Yeah. Yeah. The ordinances. So, I would say... And, and the Protestant Reformation said, more importantly, that uh, um, You know, in the Protestant Reformation, what they did was they recovered the true gospel, which had become shrouded in the Middle Ages by all kinds of superstition. And you've got, you've got Luther, you've got Calvin, you've got this recovery, this explosion of light in uh, Europe. And then you have the, the invention of the printing press and the Bible being translated into the vernacular so people can finally understand the Bible in their own language and the explosion of the Reformation and we celebrate that because many of us and ethne is driven by reformed principles so one of the principles that came out of the recovery of the gospel it raises a question well these Roman Catholic churches that were the predominant churches in 16th century Europe are they true churches at all? And of course, the majority of them were not. So Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, uh, they began expounding on what a true church is. And a true church is where you find the right preaching of the word of God and the right administration of the sacraments of the or, or the ordinances of ba baptism and the Lord's Supper. That's the definition of a church, right preaching, right ordinances. Now church discipline is a third mark of the church that some of the reformers uh, separated out, but I, I would include discipline 
within the right administration of the ordinances because it's part and parcel of the Lord's Supper itself, as we will see. So it is helpful for us to sharpen one another in our understanding of what the church is. How do you define the church? Well, it's the right preaching of the word of God. It's an assembly of people who are born again and who are submitted to the right preaching of the word and the right administration of the ordinances. Yes, sir. Yes. That's right. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I agree with that. So we're talking about an assembly of people. We're not talking about a church building. We're not talking about an ecclesiastical structure somewhere. We're not talking about a pope. Uh, we're not talking about elders. We're talking about an assembly of people who are born again and who are marked off from the world by the right preaching of the word and the right administration of the sacraments. And of course, a biblical church will also identify elders and deacons. And the spirit will gift those to the church we trust. So it's good that we have considered the church since this is a workshop on ecclesiology. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what our brother Jude is going to teach us on the ordinances because they are the definition of what I've been talking about in the previous talk and this one. Still, I want to suggest there's plenty of wrong thinking about the church, even among pastors in the following ways. Christians can think that it's fine to attend a church indefinitely without joining it. Christians think of getting baptized apart from joining the church. Christians talk about taking the Lord's Supper without being a member of the church. Christians too often do not integrate their Monday to Saturday lives with the lives of other believers. So maybe they, sh they go to church like they attend an event. You know, you, you attend the cinema and you passively receive something, entertainment or religious inspiration. And then you go home and your life is not integrated with other believers from Monday to Saturday until you come back to church to again, sit back and passively receive. Or Christians assume that they can make a perpetual habit of being absent from the church's gatherings several Sundays a month or more. I want to suggest that there is a better way to think about the church that is more in line with the principles of this, of this workshop and of what we have already begun to see. Uh, and what I'd like to do is put a definition up on the, uh, on the overhead. Uh, that is by Jonathan Lehman from his book, Church Discipline. This is one of the Nine Mark series, Building Healthy Church series. This is an excellent book, and I'm leaning on this book in all of my talk. And if you, if you like what you're hearing from Lehman, if you think this will be helpful to you, maybe I've got some extra copies. So listen to Lehman's uh, definition. Um, only those of you who have 2010 vision can read this. But he defines the church as a group of Christians who regularly gather in Christ's name to officially affirm and oversee one another's membership in Jesus Christ and his kingdom through gospel preaching and gospel ordinances. Notice the five parts of this definition. First, a group of Christians. And as our brother said, they can be meeting in a house or wherever. It's an assembly. That's what the word means. By the way, 
the idea of a multi-site church is a contradiction in terms because you can't have a multi-assembly assembly. Uh, the idea of having two services, one at eight o'clock, one at 10 o'clock, that's two different churches. It is not one church with two different meetings. And there is no concept in the New Testament of one church, multiple locations. That's just not how the word church is defined either in the Old Testament or the New, or even in secular literature in the Greek. So it's a group of Christians. It is a regular gathering, Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake the assembling together or think of the pattern we see in the book of Acts. You know, they were meeting on the Lord's day, even when it was late at night. Because of course, in Greco-Roman society, there was no weekend. And certainly the Lord's day was not set apart. So why did they meet late at night? Because they worked on Sunday. This is a point I would make with my Sabbatarian brothers. You know, the, the heavy emphasis on, on the Sabbatarian rest, well, it, it wasn't the early church's experience. They were working on the Lord's day and they were gathering late, which is why Eutychus was so sleepy when Paul went on and on until midnight and he fell out the window. So a regular gathering on the Lord's day. The third part of his definition is, it is a congregation wide exercise of affirmation and oversight. That's very important. It's not the pastors, it's not the elders, it's the entire congregation affirming one another's affirmation of faith. So when we partake of the Lord's Supper every so often in our churches, it is the congregation itself that is affirming we are the body of Christ. The purpose of officially representing Christ and his rule on earth, Lehman emphasizes, because they meet in Christ's name that is under his authority. And then the final part of the definition is the use of preaching and ordinances for the purposes of delineating the church, marking it off from the world. I think that's a helpful definition. I commend that to you. In fact, I commend all the resources of Nine Marks. Go to their website, great stuff there. And all of you who are pastors, all of you who are aspiring to be pastors, I would particularly encourage you to listen to that church, the uh, Pastors Talk podcast. It is extremely useful. And they've been doing this for years. There are hundreds of episodes and they cover discrete issues that come up in the life of a pastor. And it's, it's 20, 25 minutes and it's in an entertaining format and it's great stuff. Now, what gospel you believe has a great bearing on your orientation toward church discipline. Let me explain. Uh, consider gospel number one. Yeah, just leave it like that. Gospel number one, carefully consider this definition. See if you agree with it. God is holy. We have all sinned separating us from God, but God sent his son to die on the cross and rise again so that we might be forgiven. Everyone who believes in Jesus can have eternal life. We're not justified by works. We're justified by faith alone. The gospel therefore calls all people to just believe. An unconditionally loving God will take you as you are. Amen to that. Is everybody on the alert for trick questions? Uh, why not? What's wrong with that? Anyone? No repentance. Very good. Anything else grab you? The last one. But that could be taken in some different ways, right? I mean, certainly the Lord takes us in our, in our pollution, in our filth, in our spirit, spiritual deadness, and he causes us to be alive. So I want to be charitable to gospel number one. But you're right, there's, there's something missing. Any other comment on number one? Repent, believe, and confess. Now, let's look at gospel number two. Can you pull that up? All the way, yeah. 
God, uh, God is holy. We have all sin separating us from God. But God sent his son to die on the cross and rise again so that we might be forgiven and begin to follow the son as king and Lord. So the Lordship of Christ, anyone who repents and believes can have eternal life, a life which begins today and stretches into eternity. So the idea that we have life now and that life is characterized by, among other things, repentance. We're not justified by works, we're justified by faith alone, but he adds, the faith which saves is never alone. The gospel, therefore, calls all people to repent and believe. A contra-conditionally loving God will take you contrary to what you deserve and then enable you to become holy and obedient like his son. By reconciling you to himself, God also reconciles you to his family, the church, and enables you as his people to represent together his own holy character and triune glory. So what is the main difference between gospel one and gospel two? Yeah, there's repentance, which we saw immediately. The concept of, of eternal life now enabling us through the empowerment of the spirit to do what? To be conformed into the likeness of the son. Anything else? The church. Yeah, exactly. The idea that the Christian life is a life lived in community with other supernaturally transformed people. An emphasis on discipleship, yes. Uh, Jonathan Lehman says this. He says, if your understanding of the gospel stops with gospel number one, you will not have much use for the topic of church discipline. But if you embrace the second one, then there's a longer conversation to have. Aside from being an explicit biblical mandate, church discipline is an implication of gospel number two. Do you see why that's so? Everything affirmed in the first version is true, but there's more to say. Left to itself, it tends to yield a belief in cheap grace. The second version, I believe, is a more robust account of the biblical gospel and is more likely to lead to an understanding of the kind of grace that calls Christians to take up their crosses and follow Jesus in holy mission. So it is true that our standing before the living God is based solely on the finished work and the righteous life of Christ. We're saved by grace alone. But does that not mean, or, or rather, does that mean that it's pointless for us to energetically pursue purity? Does that mean that since Christians are sinners, that we have no chance of pleasing God at all? Some might say that. Some might say you're importing legalism into your understanding of the Christian life. But what about people like Zechariah and Elizabeth in Luke chapter 1? They were the parents of John the Baptist. Do you remember what it said about them? It said they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Or what about those churches that Paul commended for their godly example, like the church at Rome? We read about in, Acts, uh, in Romans 16. Your obedience is known to everyone. 16, 19. What about them? I think there's a category confusion going on in many of our churches. And the confusion is this. We are equating obedience with perfection. Obedience, fundamental submission, is not the same thing as moral perfection. Can we be fundamentally obedient? Yes, by God's grace we can. Through our union with Christ and the empowerment of the Spirit, can we, Romans 8, 4, fulfill the ordinances of the law? 
Yes, we can. Keep reading through Romans 7, 6. He talks about walking in the new way of the spirit. Romans 6, 4, uh, being raised to live in newness of life through the spirit. That doesn't mean moral perfection. It means substantially, observably, living differently because you're a Christian. No one is spotless. No one is morally flawless except the Lord Jesus Christ. But there have been many people throughout church history who have been marked by fundamental obedience in their lives. Not perfection, but like Elizabeth and Zechariah. That doesn't mean that these people never lusted or they never lazed around or they never got angry. They never did anything from an impure motive. doesn't mean that. But it does mean the people in that circle should be expected to be living lives that are different from the people outside of the circle. You don't have to walk around like a spiritual loser, in other words. To be a new covenant member of the people of God says something and means something significant. It means that you are empowered by the third person of the Trinity. Our sin has not been destroyed, but it has been dethroned. Sin is no longer our slave master. Growth in godliness is not out of reach for you, my sister, my brother. You can grow in godliness. You don't have to be dominated by the sins that may have been plaguing you of late. You can renounce them. You can repent. You can grow. You can change. This is why church discipline honors God. Because people who merely say that they're believers, but whose lives don't back it up, confuse the world about what it means to be a Christian and about the gospel. They send mixed messages about who Christ is. So let me ask you a question. If a congregation has been weaned on the spiritual milk of gospel number one, you know, just believe, and unconditional love, how will they react if you start talking to them about holiness and discipline? How will they react? What? They will rebel. They will rebel. They won't like it. Why not? Yeah, because they don't believe in conditions for salvation or perseverance. Jesus did believe in conditions. You know what Jesus said? Everyone who endures to the end will be saved. Mark 13. What's the condition there for salvation? endurance to the end he said everyone who endures to the end will be saved so we have to be careful I mean, it, there's no condition to regeneration there's no condition to election it's unconditional there is condition to justification what's the condition of being justified faith exactly faith is the instrument that brings justification it's a gift of God he gets all the glory Nevertheless, there's a condition. So, a congregation that has been raised on gospel number one will think, you're being judgmental. This sounds legalistic. You're saying we're saved by faith and works of some sort. What does Jonathan Lehman say about this? Why would an unconditionally loving God discipline anyone? That sounds like legalism. We're saved by faith, not by works. Once saved, always saved. So in a church like this that has not been taught the true gospel, if you try to implement church discipline, you will be run over. But now, Lehman says, picture a different congregation, one whose leaders have taught the members the gospel 
using the whole counsel of God. These members have been asked to count the cost in following Jesus from before they made professions of faith. On that note, um, you know how I came to know the Lord? Uh, I was in Washington, D.C. I was 28 years old. I was, I was a lawyer working for my home state senator. He was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, very powerful senator. And I was living for my own personal ambition. I wanted to make a name for myself. I cared about me first. I was my own God. And I went to Washington. I was in this environment, and it struck me as empty. And one day I was jogging around the neighborhood and I ran past a building with a sign that said Capitol Hill Baptist Church. And I decided I would go there on Sunday to make some contacts, political contacts. I had no religious interest at all. I began attending the church and uh, I began hearing this gospel message that I'd never heard before, even though I'd grown up going to church. And I didn't like what I was hearing. Didn't like what it said about God, didn't like what it said about me but I kept going back and I would shake hands with the pastor on the way out. I was a nominal Christian and he was a very friendly, charismatic personality. And he said, Hey, why don't we have lunch sometime? And I said, sure, I'll give you a call. But I never did, never intended to. But one day for some reason, I picked up the phone and called him and I, I said, Hey, let's have lunch. And we got together on Capitol Hill and he sized me up immediately as a nominal Christian, challenged me to study the gospel of Mark with him. I grew in my understanding of the gospel. I was seeing these genuine Christians relating to one another. I knew they were living different from me. And I came under increasing conviction of sin. And one day I went home after church and I was reading John 3 where Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And I was cut to the heart in that moment. And I repented deeply and put my faith in Christ. And I went out for a jog around the neighborhood. It was December 17th, 1995. I ran up to my pastor's study and I said to him, you won't believe this, but I just accepted Jesus as my personal savior. And he embraced me. He rejoiced with me. Do you know the first thing he said to me? If you're going to follow Christ, you better count the cost. That was his first pastoral advice to me. This is not going to be easy because to be a Christian means you're acknowledging that Jesus is in the driving seat of your life. Jesus is Lord. So that's, that's gospel number two, not gospel number one. These are people who have been asked to count the cost. They've heard that the kingdom of heaven belongs to the poor in spirit, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. They've heard that the heavenly father will cut off every branch of Christ's vine that bears no fruit. They've heard about the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. In other words, pastor, They've been well taught. And that's our privilege and responsibility to teach our people that the local church is God's evangelism plan. Bad churches are anti-missionary. If our lives look like the world, we gut the witness of Jesus wherever we are. As Nigel Lee once said of churches, we become so much like unbelievers they no longer have any questions they want to ask us. Therefore, the members of a local church have the solemn responsibility of exercising church discipline in certain cases. That's what we're going to talk about the rest of our time. Because the world does not need a Christianized shadow of itself. The world needs communities of people who are living counterculturally to the rest of the world. Matthew 5, 13. Look at this. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the basis for church discipline. Churches should look different and distinct from the world. So here is Lehman's definition of church discipline. Can we pull that up right here? Here is Lehman's definition 
from page 27 of his book. Church discipline is the act of removing an individual from membership in the church and participation in the Lord's table. It's, it's not an act of forbidding an individual from attending the church's public meetings. It is the church's public statement that it can no longer affirm the person's profession of faith by calling him or her a Christian. Now, this definition is actually a narrow definition of church discipline. For centuries, churches have distinguished between formative church discipline and corrective church discipline. Formative church discipline is positively forming you, like a preaching, preaching of a sermon, or reading a good Christian book, or being in a, dis a discipling relationship. That is disciplining, disciplining us in the sense of shaping us positively, formatively. Corrective church discipline is different. Corrective discipline, too, involves a whole spectrum of activity. Everything from correcting someone for his false, his wrong doctrine to confronting someone for the way he talks to a member of the opposite sex or maybe the way he treats his wife to holding somebody accountable for his spending habits or his spiritual disciplines or counseling a couple who are trapped in sin. All of these are examples of corrective church discipline all along the spectrum. And then if you have a situation where someone is unwilling to repent, then you get to the end of the spectrum of what's some kind, sometimes called excommunication or Lehman's definition of final church discipline, which is to remove them from membership and exclude them from the Lord's table. So that's what we're talking about as the final act of discipline. This is only done as a last resort and only after much pleading and counseling by members of the church and elders. Only if someone decides to continue in his sin unrepentantly is it appropriate to excommunicate in the sense of removing and excluding from the table. Of course, none of this means that discipline must be the main focus of our church life. So, good quote here by uh, Mark Dever in his book, Nine Marks. So, this is the guy who led me to the Lord, Mark Dever. He writes, discipline is no more the focal point of the church than medicine is the focal point of life. There may be times when you are necessarily consumed by discipline, but generally it should be no more than something that helps you get on with your main task. So it's not that we're discipline happy. It's not that we're trigger happy. Now, what's the biblical basis for discipline? Well, it's the passage we've already seen is Matthew 18, 15. Scroll that up. Zero in on verse 17. We've already thought about this. If he refuses to listen to them, to the two or three, Tell it to, not the elders, not the pastor, not the church council, not the synod, not the presbytery. What does it say? Tell it to the church, the assembly. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What does it mean to treat someone as a Gentile or a tax collector? Anybody? Someone who's never known God. Someone who obviously has no biblical morality. Unsaved. Yeah. Yeah. Outside the church, I think is even more precise. Yeah. Because he's outside the church. He's not a member of the covenant people. So Jesus is speaking into a first century context. He's speaking to Jews and he's saying, treat them as a Gentile, as one who is outside the circle. A tax collector was a traitor. He, he had relegated himself to the outside of the circle. So what is the biblical basis for church discipline? Well, it's Jesus himself. We're no more loving than Jesus is, right? We're no more merciful than he is.
So the church is supposed to look different from the world, different from Gentiles and tax collectors. We see this not only in Jesus, we see it in the Apostle Paul. Now let's turn to 1 Corinthians 5, and let's look at this a little more carefully than we did in the previous talk. Here we have in 1 Corinthians 5, a case of church discipline. First Corinthians five, it is actually reported, I'm reading from the ESV. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Who is Paul speaking to here? Who is Paul addressing? Yeah, he's addressing not the elders. He's not addressing the pastor or the association. He's writing to the church in chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2. Paul is congregational in his emphasis. And he's saying to the church in verse 2, ought you not have put the man out of your fellowship? That's discipline. That's what we saw earlier. Verse 3, for though I am absent in body, I'm present in spirit. I think what he means there is I'm present with you by virtue of the letter that you're reading. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, notice that emphasis there, the, the assembled people, and my spirit is present i.e., and you're reading this letter, with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So what does Paul say to do here in verse 5? Do what with this person? What's the language that he uses? What, a little louder? Yeah. Well, for, first let's establish what he says. What he says is, hand him over to Satan. And now I'm thinking that's pretty severe language. Uh, what does he mean by saying that? Anybody? One more time. Our sister says correctly, that what it means is excommunicate him from the church. So notice the parallel between verse 2 and verse 5. Verse 2, he states it as follows. Put him out of your fellowship. Verse 5, he describes it as hand him over to Satan. In what sense is it handing someone over to Satan by putting him out of the church? Because Satan is the ruler of this world. Now, we know theologically that God rules all the world, but there is a sense in which Satan is described as the ruler, the God of this age, and the Lordship of Christ is acknowledged in the church. Unchecked, unrepentant sin in a congregation is like leaven that silently spreads and contaminates a whole lump of dough. So Paul says, remove him. Treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And then what is the purpose for the discipline in verse 5? What's, what does the end of the verse say? Yes. Notice the rehabilitative purpose of discipline. Discipline is not for us to punish him. It is not for us to get a, get a pound of flesh or because we're so much better than these other sinners are. No. The purpose is so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. The idea is the shock of an entire congregation saying to an individual, we love you, brother, but your life is inconsistent with your profession of faith. 
we no longer see any evidence that you're a follower of Christ because you seem to love your sin more than you love Christ. And therefore, with tears, we are putting you out of the fellowship, out of obedience to Christ, and ultimately to vindicate the character of Christ, which is emblazoned on the church. Now look at the end of the chapter, verse 9 to 13. Just look at that last paragraph of 1 Corinthians 5. I wrote to you in my letter, 1 Corinthians 5, 9, not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler not to even eat with such a one. For what have I do, have to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. This is the teaching of Paul. This is the teaching of Jesus. They're saying the same thing. Now, let me address a different question, and that is, as you scroll up, when do we do this? When is discipline necessary? Because just to be clear, there, there's much confusion on this in the churches. We don't discipline sin or else all of us would be disciplined because we all sin every day. There is an ongoing battle within the believer. The, the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit. The spirit desires what's contrary to the flesh. There's a conflict that is the Christian life. We also don't discipline minor picky sins. We never discipline people in a self-righteous, personal vendetta kind of way, which I think is what Jesus is getting at, in part, when he says, judge not lest you be judged. Now, you noticed at the end of 1 Corinthians 5, Paul said, you do judge those inside. So he's referring to something different than Jesus when Jesus says, judge not. However, after all has been said, formal church discipline should occur when, and this is from Jonathan Lehman, when sins are outward, serious, unrepented of. Outward is simply the acknowledgement that we, we can't really discipline greed or pride when we suspect that it is, it's there. Uh, it must be something that can be objectively verified, proven to a congregation, seen with the eyes, heard with the ears, these kinds of things. The sin must be serious because love covers a multitude of sins. So we don't want to be hyper judgmental congregations where we go around looking for things to discipline. No, if you've been sinned against, if it's not a huge deal, if it's not essential for his well-being to confront, well, just overlook it. Love covers a multitude of sins. And then it must be unrepented of. The sinner refuses to let go of his sin. He loves his sin more than he loves Christ. Repentance is when you take God's side against your sin. So... You're the first to raise the hand, yes, I'm a sinner. From all appearances, this person, though, prizes his sin. When a church becomes convinced that a person is genuinely repentant, discipline is no longer appropriate. Genuine repentance, no longer appropriate. When a church becomes convinced that a person is unrepentant, and it's a matter that is outward and serious and verifiable, then the church is bound to discipline for the sake of the person being disciplined, for the sake of other members of the church, for the sake of Christ. And then here's another category of, of particularly heinous or uh, notorious sin. When a sin is so deliberate, so repugnant, indicative of a deep double-mindedness, that a congregation is left unable to give credence to a profession of repentance, 
it should proceed with excommunication. It, it should discipline. That's what's happening in 1 Corinthians 5. That was a particularly scandalous sin that was not even accepted in pagan society. So these are the times when we exercise this authority the Lord has given the members of a congregation. How do we relate to a person once he's been disciplined? Well, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, with such a man you shouldn't even eat. What that means is, of course, in the ancient Near East, when you ate with someone, it symbolized a lot more than we do today when we eat in the food court. You know, it means nothing. But in those days, it symbolized a companionship. It symbolized an endorsement of one's character. So Paul said, you shouldn't even eat with such a one. What that means is when, when a member of our church is disciplined, it's no longer business as usual. When we meet with him, on the agenda is his sin and his need to repent. I'm no longer just going to get together and play video games with him. I'm no longer going to play football with him like I used to do. Things are going to be different. And it's sad. It's very sad. I mean, I, over the years, uh, there's, there's a tendency among people who get disciplined that they get angry with the pastor and with the elders and with the church. So oftentimes they just leave or they harbor a grudge. Now, formal disciplinary structures are never enough. So what I'm describing to you as biblical church discipline must take place in a larger context of um, disregard the 10 reasons we're not quite there yet. This must take place in a larger context of love and community. You can have all the structures, you can follow all the steps in your churches, and discipline will be hollow and meaningless unless you have a culture of accountability where people care about one another and where they have meaningful conversation and, and where they actually confront each other for sin. You remember the spectrum of discipline that takes place? There must be conversations when things are said that are inappropriate or when there are spending habits that are out of line or what have you. If that culture is not present in the church, none of this makes any sense. It's just seen as being rigid and hard and unloving. Which is to say, if you are reforming a congregation, you do not want to speedily move into discipline. You want to teach and teach and model. You want to see the culture of the church transform before you ask the congregation to exercise this authority. Now, let me give you 10 reasons for church discipline. This is what I've taught my church in Dubai. Number one, confronting sin in people's lives is a loving thing to do. I know that's not how the world defines love. Jonathan Lehman says, the problem is most people today have a sentimentalized view of love. Love as being made to feel special. Or they have a romanticized view of love. Love as being allowed to express yourself without judgment. Have you ever heard that? Or they have a consumeristic view of love. Love as finding the perfect fit for you. In the popular mind, love has little to do with truth or holiness or maturity. So in your preaching, brothers, you have to redefine love. Number two. When we exercise church discipline, we are being faithful to Scripture. Put him out of your fellowship. Treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Number three, the apostolic church experienced plenty of church discipline. I'm thinking of 1 Corinthians, sexual sin. Galatians, serious doctrinal error. 2 Thessalonians, disobeying apostolic commands and laziness. 1 Timothy, blasphemy, and in the case of elder sin, public rebuke. Titus, divisiveness. 2 John and Jude, false teaching. Keep reading the epistles. Fully half of them have some reference to discipline happening in the community. If that's true, I ask you, 
Why is discipline so uncommon in our churches today? Why is it not happening in our churches if it was so prevalent in the New Testament churches? I want to suggest the blame is at the feet of the pastors because this is unpopular. Pastors have not done a good job teaching on meaningful membership or cultivating a culture of discipleship and accountability wherein discipline can even make sense in the first place. And it's because pastors want to be popular with their people. And discipline is a difficult doctrine. Let me say one other thing about number three. The early church experienced plenty of church discipline. Sometimes I hear people say, this is just a Western idea. You know, my, my fellow pastor in Dubai, he pastors the Arabic Evangelical Church of Dubai. He's from Syria. And one time we were talking and he said, you know, this just, this won't work in, in Eastern culture. This is something you guys can do in the West, maybe. And what I said to him is, church discipline is extremely unpopular in the West. In fact, now, if you're in the West, you have to purchase insurance because you're going to get sued when you start disciplining people. And you have to have your ducks in a row. Why do people say that church discipline is a Western concept when it was being practiced in Corinth and Ephesus and Jerusalem? Those are not, those are not Western societies. The fourth reason why we should exercise discipline is we are not self-righteously condemning people when we discipline them. What we're saying is, we don't see evidence of genuine fruit. Number five, we're not telling them they can't come to church anymore. To the contrary, we want them to come to church. Number six, discipline must always occur in the context of loving community. I've already said that. Number seven, discipline is ultimately for the glory of God. That's because the people of God bear witness to the character of God. Number eight, discipline is also good for the person who is being disciplined. Look at James 5.20. Whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death. So he might not appreciate it. He might reject our friendship, but it's good for him. Number nine. Discipline is good for other Christians as they see the danger of sin. In other words, this causes the weaker sheep to be protected as they see and fear. So we had to discipline a man who had been violent toward his wife. And I guarantee you, every husband who raised his hand affirming that act of church discipline was chastened by that and will think twice before he hits his wife. So do this finally for the, the health of the whole church because otherwise a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Now, none of this means they can't attend our church. We want them to come. We want to be loving to them. None of this means they're condemned by God. So this understanding of excommunication is different from Roman Catholicism. In Roman Catholicism, your right standing before God is dependent on the sacramental structure. It is not dependent on grace alone by faith alone. It's dependent on plugging in and turning on the spigot and receiving the dispensation of grace through the church. So when one is excommunicated, one is banished to purgatory at best and hell at worst. What we're saying is we simply can no longer affirm that this is a legitimate profession of faith. It doesn't mean we're going to be ugly. We're going to be unkind to him. It doesn't mean we're not sinners too. We are sinners. The difference is I'm repenting of my sin and this person is not. And the goal is never 
punishment, as we've seen. The goal is restoration. So I'll never forget one brother who we disciplined years ago for living with his girlfriend. And, well, some of the members of the church found out about this living arrangement and the scandal that was bringing on Christ because he was a member of our church. And so they talked to him about it. They, they said, brother, what are you doing in this living arrangement? This, this isn't how Christians live. And he stiff-armed them, rejected them. And eventually, well, the elders were consulted. And we came and, and intervened and said, brother, what are you doing? This is harming you for your spiritual life and bringing much shame on the gospel in Christ. And he didn't care. He continued in his living arrangement. He was disciplined by the church. And of course, as usually happens, he left and stopped coming to church. He was upset. And he remained upset, and he was gone. And that's how it usually is with church discipline. But in this case, several weeks later, someone noticed him sitting in the back row of the church. And then we noticed the next week, hey, he was, he was there again. Did you guys see him? And the elders made a point to reach out to him and say, hey, how are you doing? What's going on with the living arrangement? And uh, in time, he came to thoroughly repent of his sin. And what a joy it was in the next members meeting when he came and publicly confessed his sin and acknowledged his repentance. And we joyfully brought him back into membership. And he remained with us for many more years before he moved away. The whole goal of church discipline it's not because we're any better than the other sinners. It's rehabilitative. It's to restore the sinner. By the way, this is one reason why I always want to be a member of a local church. I always want to be under the accountability of God's people because I know my own heart and my heart is prone to wander. And if I'm in a place where I cannot be disciplined, if I'm not a member of a local church, I've not asked for the authority and the accountability of the church. I can't be disciplined. Don Whitney said, you can't fire somebody who doesn't work for you. You can't vote to remove a government official elected by another country. You can't appeal to a court to secure judgment on someone who isn't within its jurisdiction. In the same way, you can't formally discipline someone who hasn't joined the church. I'll never forget, a few years ago, there was one guy who... Uh, who was strongly anti-congregationalist. And uh, nevertheless, he did become a member of the church, although he, he questioned church membership as well. Well, this guy, his brother, got involved in a, an immoral relationship. And the brother attended church regularly with, with his brother, who was the member of our church. And the member of our church came to us as elders and said, Hey, my brother's in this MR relationship. I'm concerned about him spiritually. Will you discipline him? But the brother was not even a member of our church. But he thought just because he shows up on Sunday and is a member of the assembly sometimes, that therefore we have jurisdiction or authority. But that is not the case. Because one has to self-consciously identify with the community and accept the, con the congregation's authority before he can be disciplined. Well, much more could be said, but I will bring it to a close now. If you have specific questions, well, let me say first, discipline is the most difficult thing that we face as elders. These are very difficult questions. The final step of church discipline means removing someone from membership and excluding him from the table. It is not. Finally, the responsibility of the pastors or the elders. It's the responsibility of the whole assembly. Only the church has the authority to excommunicate. Now, elders usher the whole process through. Elders are in charge of it. Elders teach on it and shape the congregation's understanding. Well, if you want to read more on uh, church discipline, You know, where I come from, whenever I say I'm going to give away a free book, even before I describe it, all the hands go up. But if this is a particular issue 
that is facing you in ministry or you have a particular interest, um, I've got three copies of Lehman's book to give away. Anybody want these? And our brother Babu has assembled a number of valuable uh, church documents, including our church covenant and, um, and other materials that are pertinent to this. And I've got five of three of these to give away, three in English and two in what I assume is Telugu. <laughs> three English. This is good stuff. So John in the back. And who wants these Telugu copies? I've got two. So, John, this one is for you. Uh, if you want, if you want to uh, read more about church discipline, then um, I recommend Galatians, Second Thessalonians, First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, and Jude. In other words, this is a biblical concept. And furthermore, if you want proof of church membership in the New Testament, I refer you to all of the church discipline passages because church discipline is the flip side of church membership. If you can put somebody out, then you have an identifiable community. You can put them in. And let me say, finally, this is ultimately for the glory of God. So brother pastors, you will take heat for this. This will be difficult to implement. But do we care about the reputation of Christ? John L. Dagg was right when he said, when discipline leaves a church, Christ goes with it. Our lives are to be like a storefront display of the character of God to the world. Being a part of a church brings wonderful privileges, but also weighty responsibilities. Let's pray that we would help our people to discharge those responsibilities in ways that honor God. Let's pray.